Hey everybody, it's Jeremiah, and today I read a recent Pulitzer Prize winner in fiction. Is it All the Light We Cannot See? No. Sympathizer? No. Empire Falls, The Goldfinch, This is from the Goon Squad, Orphan Master Sun? No. None of those. Today I read Tinkers. Tinkers? So small. Tinkers by Paul Harding. So Tinkers is the work of one Paul Harding, who worked on it for about 10 years. Harding is one of those creative writing lifers, you know, undergrad in English, MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, setting up a steady literary career. From all here is like a Michael Shaben, Dave Eggers, Karen Russell, usually a short story collection or two, then a promising debut novel, then something really meaty a couple novels in. Also worked for Shaben with uh, the Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, another, another Pulitzer Prize winner in fiction. Instead, what Harding has done here is coalesce all his best writing for a long period into a small but potent package. It's the fiction award that he won, but it could have easily been poetry. Harding's sense of rhythm, meter, alliteration, and metaphor are all on point here. Harding is a longtime student of Marianne Robinson, whose own Gilead won the Pulitzer about 20 years ago. The comparisons come instantly. Just like Gilead, Tinkers is a book set in America's past that conjures up a religious imagery and iconography and that contrasts with the reality and harshness of life in 19th and 20th century America. It's clear the numerous and generous plot and thematic artifacts that Harding has taken from his mentor. Many writers are terrible at plot and happy to find inspiration somewhere, so they get to the business of creating beautiful sentences and poignant portraits of humanity. It's clear that Harding is one such person. Tinkers is not a lesser book for it, if only because his portraits and sentences are really, really good. Well crafted, polished by 10 years until they simply shine. So what is Tinker's about? Tinker's is the story of George Washington Crosby, a clock repairman and self-named Tinker, and his father Howard, who sold goods to backcountry folk that struggles with epilepsy. The narrative winds lazily from George on his deathbed to Howard's experiences, and back again, covering over a century of history and the experience of these two men. The plot is fine, but the real treat here, as in most Pulitzer winners, is the writing. There are some scenes that are simply too exquisite not to quote from directly, Let's take a few examples. Howard is George, the protagonist's father. He suffers some epileptic seizures. Here's his account. What is it like to be full of lightning? What is it like to be split open from the inside by lightning? Howard used to imagine that it was like the rupture of a fit. Although he never remembered them, he had the sense that, although there was cold before and chills after, during his seizures, his blood boiled and his brain nearly fried in its skull pan. Howard sat baffled by his diet of lightning, as if some well-intentioned being desired to give him a special gift, and spoon-fed him the voltage from behind the door. Other, larger, inhuman souls might very well thrive on such a feast. Howard thought angels, but the image he had of the seraphim, with their long, blonde curls and flowing white robes and golden halos, did not fit with the more frightening, dark, powerful species he conjured, which would gorge on a light and what, when ingested by him, Instead of sating, instantly burst the seams of his thin body. The actual seizure was like the opposite of death, or a bit of the same thing death was, but from a different direction. Instead of being emptied or extinguished to the point of unselfishness, Howard was overfilled, overwhelmed in the same state. Here's another selection, this time ostensibly from George's own journal. Tempest Borealis. The sky turned silver. The pond turned silver from the silver sky. It looks like a pool of mercury. The wind blew and the trees showed the silver-green undersides of their leaves. The sky turned from silver to green. We went to the dock where our wooden robots were tied by their noses to aluminum cleats. The wood of the dock was bleached silvery white. We knelt at the edge of the dock and leaned close to the water. So the silver sky skin disappeared and we saw twigs and weeds and minnows and blood pump leeches squiggling along. We could not see them but we knew that small silver burly brook trout hovered out of our view several feet away just under where the sky skin started again, beyond the ends of the boats. The trout were invisible in the water, green-backed like the weeds and green-black water grass, until they rolled over and broke the water skin to eat insects and show their silver-green undersides. Wind combed through the fir trees around the rim of the pond like a rumor, like the murmur of old men muttering about the storm behind the mountain. The storm came up from behind the mountain, shrouding the peak. Lightning crawled down the mountain and dragged at the water, lapped the shallows with electric tongues, 
stunning bolt-eyed frogs and small trout and silver minnows. Thunder cracked like falling timber and shook the cabin as it clapped the water skin. These poetic interspersions persist throughout the book. They are beautiful, resonant, and multi-layered. Give a feeling of density in a good way. This is otherwise small and slight book. The story it tells of fathers and sons, the secrets they keep, or the personal victories and shames, is fine. The plotting is that of a young novelist. There is no long strands connecting distant storylines to a suddenly concordant whole, like you might see in a later Delilah or Friends in novel. Whatever the reason for this narrow focus, the results is something quite positive. A tight, narrowly defined novel that knows that what it is and allows itself to indulge in extended and beautifully poignant vignettes. Great writing is great writing, whether exceedingly long like Ulysses or Middlemarch, or exceedingly short like Borges and I, Green Hills of Africa, A Perfect Day for Banana Fish. Tigger's Fall is the short end of the novel spectrum, but it's not worse for it. Check it out. Like most Pulitzer Prize winners in fiction, it is generously and beautifully written. But unlike some other winners, it won't take you a week to get through. Though you may want to take your time, to fully take in its sumptuous sentences and multi-layered prose. As always, stay awesome, and keep reading.